episode of Turn Left. I am your host, Indiana's own Dana Black, coming to you live. Yes, all the way live from Black Pearl Studios, where we talk about Indiana politics from the left side of things. Whoo, y'all, this has been a rough week. Uh, We are still seeing a rise in COVID cases, both nationwide and in our state. Um, uh, The total deaths are up over 223,000 Americans. And in the state of Indiana, we are up over 4,000 deaths. And that is up. Uh, We have 2,880 new cases and 42 new deaths as of today. Now, I want y'all to consider something. Uh, It was mid-September when the governor said, you know, I want to go ahead and move to stage five and let's begin to reopen our state up. This was in September. In September, we had a total of 850 people in the hospital for COVID. That was in mid-September. Now we're in stage five. We have 1,484 people in hospitals. I don't know about y'all, but I ain't so sure this opening all the way up is really working out the way we think it should. Especially when you have people arguing over whether or not they should put on a mask. Uh, If you got a chance to catch the governor's debate, I did, because you know I'm a junkie like that. I'll, I'll watch the governor's debate. Uh, the libertarian says, nah, I ain't going to make nobody wear a mask. Do what you want to do, how you want to do, spread your virus all over. I don't care. It's my risk. But no, you don't understand. You're putting other people at risk, right? And governor Holcomb says, well, I, we should wear masks and we should, and we should, and we should. But as Dr. Woody Meyer says, that was just a suggestion. He wasn't really serious. And I'm, I know y'all don't like it and some of y'all can't stand it, but Dr. Woody Myers is right. If we want to get a hold of this thing, we need to have a mandate and penalties because see, now you're putting my life at risk. I'm a 50 year old black woman who has a history of obesity, high blood pressure, and I'm on blood thinners. I am high risk. You are putting me at risk. If I have an, an ounce or a, 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 a think that I might been infected, I have to isolate. But you don't care about me. All you care about is your silly rights. Yo, but you don't have the right to kill me. And now we're getting numbers and getting information that the hospitals in the northern part of our state and the southern part of our state are struggling to keep up. Those of us in the metropolitan area, we are very lucky because there are enough hospitals and fortunately enough ICU beds if we need them. But the other areas of the state are starting to get stressed out. All because you don't want to wear a mask. I'm going to tell you something. Wearing a mask every day is horrible for my skin. I have like dark patches and I'm funny looking and I got pot marks all from wearing a mask. But if I wear a mask, it means I won't be dead. I might be funny looking for a few months, but I won't be dead. So I'm gonna need each and every one of y'all to pay attention to these numbers. These numbers are going in the wrong direction. And unfortunately, we do not have leadership in our state house right now that understands the significance of doing what's right to protect each other. I don't wanna die. I'm 50, I finally made it. My gray hair is starting to look halfway decent. Could If you don't do anything else, just could you protect me? Selfishly, could you protect me? Um, I want to kind of go uh, on a national scene real quick. Um, did you notice that uh, Vice President Pence and Attorney General Barr were in Indiana this week? Hmm, I'm wondering why they're making trips to fly over Red State, Indiana. Maybe it's not so flyover. Maybe it's not so red. Maybe people are going to turn out and those numbers are up. Our t- early vote numbers are up all over the state. And we know when the turnout is high, that means you might ne- need to get your surfboard out because the blue wave might be coming through your state. I'm just saying, I'm just saying 2008 is 2020, 2008. It could very well be. But here are the things that we need to think about. 
Lawyers are saying that they cannot find the parents of 545 migrant children because of the separation order. We have 223,000 deaths. We have racial animus all over the place. One of our sixth district congressional candidates had BB gun shot at her, along with a whole bunch of racial nonsense. Janine Lake running in the sixth district, running against the Pence boy. There's a lot of unrest in our nation right now. And if you, listen, I don't necessarily want to go back to the way things were because, you know, we had problems then. But I feel like we can move forward. And I would like to have some calm and some peace in the White House. I would like to have some leadership in the State House. And that super majority in the state in our state house is not taking care of our teachers, not taking care of our students. We're gonna be, we're gonna go the way of some of the Pennsylvania and New York school systems where they had to shut back down again. And of course, we'll have Senator Bray sending another threatening letter to superintendent saying, if you don't open all the way back up, we're gonna cut your funding. Cause that always makes sense when you need more money now for hand sanitizers and wipes and gloves and face masks. They need more money now, but you're gonna cut. I don't understand why we continue to have people voting against their interests. And uh, teachers, I'm going to need you to, to work on that. But one last thing before I get to my fabulous guest tonight. Tal Rikita, who is running for attorney general, is saying that he wants to stay in the lawsuit to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. Say what? We're in the middle of a global pandemic, dog. People are dying. And you want to take away what little bit of health care they might possibly have? Jonathan Winesapple, y'all need to make sure y'all vote for Jonathan Winesapple for AG so we can stop spending Hoosier dollars to take insurance away from Hoosiers. Now, most of us are going to have a pre-existing condition if we survive COVID. We should not allow affordable health care and affordable insurance are two different things. Now, if you want to get rid of the insurance companies, I'm for that. But doggone it, if I get sick, I need to be covered. If I'm paying you premiums and deductibles and all of that other stuff, cover it. Cover it. And we should be fighting for people. I'm, I'm sick of these dudes running around here pretending like we don't matter as Hoosiers. And what we need does not matter. So that's my rant for tonight. My apologies for starting a little late. But you know, I was basking in the glow. I was basking in the glow of the people that represent me. Yes, me personally, where I live. Ha <laughs> ha. First up, you've ha I've had her on the show before. Uh, she was one of my favorite guests when I first started. And she gave she came on and gave me a chance when this show was fledgling. She sat with me for a whole hour and we chopped it up. Y'all, y'all give it up for my <laughs> state senator. My state senator. Senator Gene Bro from District 34. Senator Bro, welcome to Turn Left. Thank you very much, Senator. Can I just say, listening to you, I'm a, I am a news junkie or, or a political junkie, so I watch MSNBC and CNN every night, hour after hour after hour after hour. Rachel Reed, The Readout, I mean, all of those shows. And you are right there. You are just like, you sound just like they sound. You have the narrative, you have the humor, you have the, the spot on points that you're making. Quite a, quite impressive, young lady. Thank and, you. And thank you for the invitation to be on your show. And I'm honored to represent you in Senate District 34. I love it. I love it. And, and a first time guest. I've been, y'all, y'all don't know how excited I am about having this man on. You know, you don't always get a chance to talk to our elected officials. I, I'm lucky because I kind of hound people. I ask anyway. And and when he gave me, he told me, he said, Dana, just keep doing what you're doing. That lit me up and it meant the world to me. Because I didn't even, you don't know who's paying attention. You don't know who's watching. I, I, I'm excited to have him on because he's been representing this district. And even when I wasn't living in this district, when I would run around Marion County, I saw him everywhere. If he wasn't at a clergy meeting or an NAACP, wherever there's something going on in the city of Indianapolis, Representative Greg Porter has been there. Y'all, y'all give a warm, warm turn left welcome to my house rep, Greg Porter, District 96. Welcome to the show. Oh, what to say, what to say, what to say. I'm so glad to be 
here with you this evening, Danny. You are doing a remarkable job. And I just did all some of the words that um, my colleague, uh, Senator Bro, had said in regards to you. You have uh, not only talked to talk, you've walked to walk, you ran for office, you went against that, that guy who used to be speaker and gave him a run for, for his dollar and dollars. And, um, you know, your advocacy is not, has not gone and will not go unnoticed here in this community. And as uh, Senator Bro said, just keep doing what you're doing because it, because you because you're on the right side of justice. You're on the right side of equity. You're on the right side of the human infrastructure that we all need, and we need to work for diversity, inclusion here in our great city and our state and this nation. You on the right side thank of it, and thank you very much. Oh my God, y'all killing Amen. me! Ooh, ooh, that's what they say. Give them their flowers <laughs> while they alive. Give them their flowers while they alive. All right. <laughs> I want, uh oh, I did that again. Uh, I want, if I can get you, let me change the layout real quick. That way we can highlight. Uh, Representative Porter, can you tell the people who you are and where you come from and what got you involved in this political game? Okay, I'm, I'm going to give you the, the, uh, the, the shotgun approach in regards to that. Um, I've been blessed to represent House District 96 for um, over, over 25 years. Wow. Uh, started my career off as a community-based organizer uh, over in the West Indianapolis at uh, Mary Rigg Neighborhood Center. Then I went over to Christopher House and spent like 10 years there. Then left there and went to Lieutenant Governor's office uh, in Commerce uh, with O'Bannon. Then joined his staff and then ran for political office. Uh, first time I, I got my chops uh, formed up in regards to politics, way back in the 80s with Operation Big Boat with uh, Cordelia Lewis and uh, the, the late, great Mrs. Gurton at the Urban League and getting people out to vote and things like that and did a lot of things with Operation Push that was being housed out of my, my home church of Phillips Temple CME Church here in Indianapolis. So I started off as a grassroots person uh, and, and, and I, I'm still there right now and a lot of that was done in my early days at Short Ridge and went over to the Quaker institution called Earlham. And, mm -hmm. um, and you know, how we are, we want to be a consistent builder and be change agents. And that's where I, I, I got bit by the bug, bug of, uh, for, for public service. And, you know, one of the things that I've always admired, even, you know, as I was watching from afar and living in another district was your desire to be in the community. You're not someone out here, you know, saying, look at me, look at me. You just show up to the, the community meetings and you share information. What is it about being in the community that fuels you? Well, you, you, you know, Dana, we, we, we all have a ministry and, and not necessarily biblical, but, but we are anointed to do certain things. And when I was coming up, you know, my, my grandfather, uh, I'm going to go way back to, you know, he was an insurance man. And I used to ride with him when he went and got that 15 and 25 cent from people and saw what he did. If someone did not have the means to pay their insurance, he would take money out of his pocket to pay the insurance wow. so they wouldn't lapse. And that was when I was four and five and six years old. And I remember that. And that's the reason why you, 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 you always need to eat something for somebody. If you can't help nobody, why are you here? And, and my attitude is that my, our, our work, our work is not done until the weakest and the humblest has a way to, to make a better life for themselves. And that, that's what keeps us dry because our people, no matter what their ethnicity is, what they, who they are, they will, they, you know, they are, are somewhat dis, they, they're disenchanted. They are disillusioned, but you know what? Uh, Senator Brown and, and, and members, they are not going to disappear. And that's what keeps me going in regards to that because as because I want to work myself out of a job. Right. I want to work myself out of being a state rep. That we, we won't have to have state reps or anything like that anymore for me. That's what I want to do. I love it. I love it. You, I mean, you're inspiring. Senator Bro, tell the people who you are and where you come from. Excuse me? Tell the people who you are and where you come from. Oh, great. Okay. Well, you know, I, I have a story similar to uh, Greg's. I was just uh, profiled. I'm going to be profiled by CSG Magazine. And they um, just asked me this question yesterday, and I, I shared it then, and I'll share it now. Um, you know, mine comes from um, my family. 
And um, my mother, on, on my mother's side in particular, her mother uh, was a Democrat because of Roosevelt, the New Deal, and all the things that he did for folks in uh, West Virginia, which is where they lived, and coal miners. My grandfather was a coal miner. But my grandfather was a Republican because Lincoln freed the, uh, the slaves. You know, that was pretty common, mm -hmm. where a lot of folks would, would support uh, the Republican Party, which which was a little bit more like the Democrat Party than really. They but, were more progressive, but, yeah. Um, but nonetheless, um, you know, so half of my mother's family would go with my grandfather to the polls on election day, and the other half would go with my grandmother. Unfortunately, my, my mother went with my grandmother. And anyway, long story short, uh, my grandmother um, understood the importance of labor unions. She understood the importance of uh, government and the government could provide benefits and could provide resources that would aid and help life and aid and help you to have a better life. And she made sure that she was aware of all of those benefits that were available to families of um, survivors of uh, black lung, which ultimately my grandfather succumbed to. Mm. But my grandmother never had to work a day in her life uh, because she had the uh, benefits uh, that she was entitled to as a survivor and a spouse of someone who gave their lives going down into the coal mines, which mm -hmm. if you've ever done, if you've ever gotten on one of those trolleys to go inside a coal mine, that's something to do um, every single day of your life. And so she was certainly entitled to all of the uh, benefits that she ultimately received, but she instilled in all of her children. Um, and another thing was she was the, um, she was denied opportunity to go to college because of her gender five or six girls, she made sure that all of her daughters went to college and that she understood the not only the role of government, but she understood that education is the great equalizer. And so mm -hmm. she imparted mm -hmm. that in her children. And I just grew up with a, with a badass mom. You know, I can't say it any differently. You and, did. Uh, when you grow up with all of that, and, and everyone in family, really, all, all, of the, uh, all of my members were, were all very um, um, opinionated, were all very engaged, were all very um, involved politically. Um, you know, we, we, we keep up on current events. And so, um, you know, you, for me, it's a, a sort of you live what you learn or you learn what you live or however it goes. But, um, you know, I sort of grew up around it. And um, before you know it, it's 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 you. And you don't even realize that that you're being influenced um, in that way. I love it. And if you like anything that either of our uh, incumbent elected Democrats have to say and you want to donate to their campaigns, there's a link in the info oh. section so you can click on their link, donate to their campaigns, because you know what? It ain't cheap. They're both running for re-election. It ain't cheap. So click on the link. Um, but I guarantee you're going to hear some amazing stuff tonight. Okay. So, well, you know, I can like say, Dana, that that is so true. And I'm so glad you're emphasizing that because even me as an elected official, it took me an, a while to understand that, um, first of all, elections aren't cheap. Uh, it costs money for us to be competitive. And as uh, as Black folks, um, you know, we have to rely on each other. We don't have the big, um, you know, the big trust funds and the, the, big corp the big corporations in our districts because, you know, they gerrymander us into these districts where there's no, there's no business, there's no real infrastructure for um, um, some uh, real finance. So we rely on each other. Absolutely. And, and we sometimes take care of each other. Absolutely. And so we're always, we're always working on a deficit. So I appreciate you mentioning that and explaining that to people because it does take money and we are at a disadvantage in getting money. And the only way we really get it is from each other. And so uh, we really do need you to reach out and help us. Well, one of the things I try to do with Turn Left is is try to help candidates. Like when people ask me, when are you running again? When are you running again? Well, obviously, I'm well represented. I don't need to run, right? I'm taken care of. But one of the, I, I can't believe I didn't think about it until like the summertime. Why don't I just put their donation links up and we'll just turn each show into a mini fundraiser. But it ends up being where you have two or 300 people watching and you just never know who is going to donate to those campaigns, you know? And so I'm. this is just my way of just like- And it, and it doesn't take much. Nah, it doesn't take much. You it know? doesn't take $2, $5, whatever. It so, all adds up. So the two of you um, are are residing in super in super minorities, being uh, in the state senate and in our state house. But one of the things that you guys have to your advantage is that you guys are both a part of the Legislative Black Caucus. And one of the things that I get excited about is that you all travel all over the state. 
um, explaining some of the legislation that is that's happening um, that is that is imperative to the um, African American community. Uh, it was uh, Representative Robert Shackle Shackleford who brought it to my attention that we only have black reps from Lake County and Marion County. Well, there are black people all over the place, right? And right. The, so talk about um, what it means to you guys to go to different communities who don't have African American representation in the state house and explain mm. what's going on in the state mm. house when it comes to our communities. Uh, well, I, it, 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 I, I will go first since I, I've been around a little longer uh, than, than Sandra Bro, um, and she's been on before. You know, when when, when I go to Evansville, I mean, my people kind of hail from from uh, uh, Paducah, Kentucky, and, and, and they may stop in Evansville. And so I, I have uh, relatives in Evansville, Indiana. And so when I go and talk to them, you know, I, I'm, I'm their rep. Uh, even though there's not African American down there, or, or down in Jeffersonville, and I mean, in, in the DNA ACP has a, a heck of a sh chapter down in uh, Northern Kentucky and in Southern Indiana. Mm -hmm. and, I, and one thing that the God rest his soul, represent Bill Crawford and, and Glenn and, and, and um, Congresswoman Carson said, they said, you know, at one point there were only like five or six African Americans in, in the General Assembly, and they they, and they shouldered all the African Americans in, in the state of Indiana. And that is what we have to do. I live with you, but I will represent the needs of, of African Americans throughout the state. Because no matter, you know, when you hear white Republicans say, I vote my district. Well, you know what? Every vote that we take represents everybody in the state, That's all right. six million people. That's right. And see, you know, you can't, you can't divorce yourself from the, the six million people who actually live here, okay? You can try, but every vote that you make at the state level affects all individuals. So we, 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 we shoulder that and we uplift that as a black caucus. That's the reason why we go to Jeffersonville and Lafayette, Indiana and South Bend and places like that. Well, I, I'm still shocked that we don't have any representation out of Fort Wayne. I, I mean, I'm not saying, you know, I like Phil Giaguinta like everybody else, but it's still, Allen County is a, in, and Fort Wayne is the second largest city. So it's still, it's kind of shocking to me that we don't have some minority representation. We, we, we've been trying, Dana, to recruit um, from up in that area. We've had uh, a couple of nibbles, but we've never been able to get a real bite. Well, you got some gerrymandering. Yeah, gerrymandering, and plus you got some you got some city councilors that are uh, kind of go on the come yeah. up. So I'm excited yeah. about what's yeah. going on in yeah. Fort Wayne. There, 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 there's a female that I can't think of her name um, that we were we've been really trying to recruit um, to run up there, but it, but it is they're, they're ugly districts, um, you know. Um, so right. we, they, they they would have to raise, and as I said, we don't they don't unfortunately have the benefit of raising a lot of a lot of money for. Poor uh, Senator Melton learned that when he was trying to run for governor. Uh, he had a very hard time raising money because the white folks just don't give to black folks and black folks don't give to black folks. So that means, you know, we, we don't really have an opportunity to be competitive. And unfortunately, until there's some finance law revisions, um, you know, it takes money to be competitive. You got to have money. And, um, and, and that's a sad story. Uh, because it really does affect the outcome many times and it really affects um, the caliber of person you get as a candidate. Um, but so, yeah, we, we've been trying, but it's a hard sell to get somebody to leave their city county seat if they've got a secure seat um, to run for a seat that, um, you know, as, as a Senate, you know, I'll speak for the Senate, um, you, you know, we may not have the, the money either to help them uh, to the extent that they need to be helped. Um, so they're, you know, we're, we're going to rely upon a lot from them. And, um, you know, they, they just don't have that foundation. Mm -hmm. So it's been it's been tough. But but definitely Allen County is um, somewhere that we that we've been trying to uh, as well as St. Joe. Oh, yeah. County. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's that's Ariel Brandy country up there. I know that is, things are popping up there. She's uh, she, yeah. she's the president. There's, of there's some there's some bright folk up there. But, you know, it was representative, um, I believe. And Greg, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was Representative Lonnie Smith that was the first one to start this sort of. Uh, take it on the road approach to the Indiana Black Legislative Caucus. And I will tell you the one thing that always strikes me is when we go into communities where um, there, you know, there's a small uh, population of, of minorities, um, 
but the majority, of course, are, are majority folk or, or white folk. And but it always amazes me that we get well, sometimes more white folks hmm. at these things than we do black folks all across the state. And more white folks come up to us thanking us for bringing them this information and for, um, you know, people are, are hungry mm-hmm. to just be included yes. and to have somebody acknowledge you and to provide you with some information and to give you some insight. I mean, there are a lot of political junkies out here. Um, and so what we're doing, uh, people are really, they just really respond to it and they very much appreciate it. And and I enjoy it because, you know, we get to go eat every, everywhere we go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, that <laughs> Rona... Restaurants. <laughs> what was you going to say, Representative? I, I think I, I think I, I want to emphasize something that that Senator Broke touched on is that let's talk about Fort Wayne because it even affects here in Indianapolis on the east side and southeast side the way they they gerrymander or cut the district the way they cut the district of Fort Wayne cut out did the African-American community in thirds. Hmm. So therefore, the, their voting influence had, it was, was uh, uh, Diminished. Had, had been depreciated mm-hmm. by the way they threw the line. Now, usually you talk about stacking and packing, but in some communities, they dilute, so you won't have that diversity or that inclusion of, of, of a variety of individuals to represent individuals in the state house. Uh, we did wind up with Joe Taylor up in South Bend mm-hmm. area for a couple of years. And then he went on and to do some other things. So every once in a while you get a little snippet. And I and I can remember before Representative Pryor was in the Pike Township, I kept telling people that, that, that we could win that area. And then finally we did. The, 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 the time has come. And that's the reason why this, this election is so important is to break the super min- minority on both sides, mm-hmm. and particularly the House, so that we can use that to become more, to have more representation, embrace more of the our constituency and their needs by 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 not having a super mi- uh, super majority run the state house uh, for, for for next Craig, year. Craig, may, may I ask you how, how are you guys are? You need what one or two seats in order to break. That majority and how how are you all doing? I've heard your races are, are we, pretty competitive. Okay. Yeah, uh, we, we we need two. We 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 need really one seat, but we want four or five or, or eight seats. Sure, so that sure. someone if someone becomes ill or can't do something, uh, we we have a backup. So but uh, we, we need we, one we, seat to break we, the, the supermajority. That is correct. Okay, I see. That's why we we've been we've been fighting with the house. Really, they don't know it because we've been doing it in silence. But um, we've been trying to get money from places. Our caucus has been trying to get money, but we are so down. We're ten out of fifty, and the house has just one seat that they need to, in order to be able to break that supermajority. So everybody's been telling us, "No, I'm sorry, we gave our money to the house. We gave our money to the house races." So we're we're having a really hard time as the Senate caucus, and we've got. Some really good races. We've got um, Fatty Cador, who has a really good shot mm-hmm. at uh, upending uh, John Ruckel's house. We have uh, Belinda Drake. We have uh, Ashley Eason. We have Pete Cowden. We have Derry Davis. We have um, uh, Sanders up in Hamilton County. Although you know that that that, that, that was a that little tough. Still has, that district still has a little work, although it's trending in the right yeah. direction. Yeah. Um, and so we've got some good candidates and some potential. Uh, Teresa Bruno. Um, we've got some good candidates that have an opportunity. Um, so we're, we've been trying to shake every branch that we can to see what money we can fall out. But the house keeps taking all of our money. I mean, money the house has a, a better check. probability. But Gene, the, the house has a better probability of breaking. I know, I know. Yeah, I'll like, tell you what. You know, that's what everyone's been telling us. That Hamilton it County was. area. And, and that's, that's a reality. And, and, and I don't know if, you know, if we want to, continue to debate the politics of it, but that's the reality. We're one away. We're one away, and, and, and we, we feel like we can pick up a lot more than one with this climate that's there right now, as you can right. pick up several, but yeah. I don't think you'll be able to pick up 
eight or nine. Well, I mean, but you guys got like yeah, Naomi Bechtel. Right? Na Naomi Bechtel. You going to pick up eight or nine, are you? Oh, yeah. They got, listen, they're going to get, I oh, believe yeah. they're going to get all of those Hamilton County. They're going to get uh, Naomi Bechtel, which is uh, Boone in Hamilton County. They're going to get Ashley Klein, which is in Hamilton County. We, we they're going to get Ashley, too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then they're going to get uh, Amy Rivera Cole. That one's the, going to be the sweetest one because he, she's taking on Houston, and Houston thinks he's the anointed one. And she's getting ready to put some coal in his dreams. And Amy Revere Cole is going to win that seat. And then uh, Pam Decker. I like her commercials. Yes. And Pam Decker is going to flip. Guess what? See, District 88. So I think that whole, I, I'm, I'm super confident. Like that whole Southern Hamilton County, uh, uh, Boone County, I think all of those house seats are flipping. In fact, uh, IBJ just dropped an article last week talking about how, you know, G Tor is out campaigning and Houston is oh, out. Tor, Tor is Ashley Klein, right? Yeah. Uh, Ashley yeah. fighting against Tor. Yeah, yeah. yeah Ashley's putting yeah. up a hell of a fight. Yeah, and then, you know, Houston, who thought he was going to be the next one, you know, he's got to go out and knock doors. But that's, but that's what elections are about. You shouldn't be sitting back on your laurels and not having to earn that seat. And them, them guys been sitting back doing whatever they want. And now we're going to see. Well, now more teachers are upset. Let's see how they turn out. You know what I'm saying? Well, Union I, folks. I like, I like, I like your uh, reprimand of teachers voting against their interests and get on board. Because, you know, I've, I've had a problem understanding that, too. It's like, you know, we are the ones who, who are constantly fighting to increase your salary to make sure that your classrooms are, are, are uh, adequately funded and to make sure that uh, the dollar follows the kid and that we stop all this uh, money being diverted to vouchers and to virtuals. And, you know, we're, it's, it's the Democrats, yet they constantly vote Republicans. I don't, I don't understand that. I never got it either. You got to, you got to take on that uh, representative Porter. Well, you, you know, they, you, you're absolutely right. They, we, we are always one to come in and, and, and save the teachers uh, because they don't understand. Uh, and I, I think, you know, I mean, and for example, with, with the former Speaker Boswell and the governor, with two years ahead, this study committee about teachers' pay. Two years. They studied it to death. They studied it so, so, and, and they studied so much, it, it's been more mummified. They studied it so long. Okay? And they can come up with no conclusions. Uh, but then they say, well, we, we gave 600 and something million dollars more to education than we ever had. Well, yeah, but you got to remember, you got over 100, probably over $125 million have gone to virtuals with no accountability. And lost 70 million um, of that. Yeah, you know, it was really more than that. They, they said 87, mm -hmm. but it's really more than that. Mm. Because when you, start, when, you start, when you start tearing up the carpet of virtuals, when you start tearing that carpet up, it's a lot more than that mm. because they said they can do it cheaper. But as soon as they got their $65 on, uh, I mean, 65 cent on the dollar first, then two or three years, they came back. And I can remember Bainey being in Ways and Means in 2016 saying, mm -hmm. well, they need more money because they can't do it. I said, there's no bricks and mortar. That was the argument. But now they would try to get them up to 100% or 95%. Of, of of you know off of a dollar, I think we knocked it back down to ninety, you know ninety cent on a dollar. But heck, they started off at like sixty five to seventy seven, sixty five to seventy percent of a dollar on, on a dollar. So you know, can and, I, and I, guess I, what? I, Software is cheaper. Software is cheaper mm -hmm. than bricks and mortar. But they want okay. the same. So somebody's getting lined. Mm -hmm. Can I can I tell you? Uh, I was in one of those committee meetings, education or appropriations, one of those. And we were talking about virtual schools and funding them and so forth. And I made the uh, motion that we fund them virtually. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we should do. Cause I was, I was angry. Like these people were, they literally lied about their enrollment and we didn't even bother to really try to get that money back. Put it like this. Attorney Attorney General Curtis Hill has spent more money trying to get take away the ACA than we did trying to get our money back that they took from us. Where are our priorities? Exactly. The study well, just you know. came out this past week. Uh, a report just came out 
and it was like I believe it and because we, we had an audit, a finance audit committee meeting last week, and it, that's that's when it was divulged that when you look at it, it was uh, over 150 million dollars impact of virtual education wow. that was not given that the dollars that were spent that did not benefit children. Mm. A child will walk into a school for 15 minutes and they will count that child as 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 a student. And, and they some knew, students were not even there or some students were even deceased. And and see, they knew, you know what? I believe that there are players within that state house that knew what they were doing. Sean Denny, who, oh, yeah. who ran for Congress a couple years ago, he, when I ran, he was like my education guru because that was the area that I was the weakest in, I felt like. And he sat down and he explained it to me. When you got these for-profit, you guys already know, but for our listeners, you got these for-profit institutions that are trying to be about education. They're going to take their profit off the top so your tax dollars is going to wall street first before it even hits a student but these guys blatantly lied and i believe you look at you follow the money i bet you the people that own those virtual schools and some of these for-profit charter schools find okay, out said charter schools are right there with them find out how much money they've donated you know i, to I campaigns. arlington high school i was just devastated at what I saw in Arlington, and they were the um, they they were the uh, result of uh, this charter uh, finagling and um, trying to find profit. And when um, so they thought they could get profit, so they took the school and, and then put the kids in there and put them in there for a couple of years. But then the money didn't really come, and the profit started uh, falling off. And so they decided, well, we're not going to be in this business anymore. It's not profitable for us. So they kicked the school, they kicked the kids back to IPS. Now the kids have, I mean, they've been, there was no stability. There was no consistency. And, and you it know, was our kids that suffered, that paid the price for that. And that would and, never and happen. And it really just, it just broke my heart to see the kids. And it would Say that again. It would never happen in Washington Township. I'm a North Central grad, right? There's no way anybody's going up to Washington Township and saying we are taking over this school system like they did the Gary schools and Muncie schools. And what was what was so infuriating about those school takeovers, it was some dude in Crawfordsville who probably only drove through Lake County and probably was never in Muncie that decided, oh, I'm going to write this piece of legislation that's going to disenfranchise local communities from being able to educate their kids the right way that was infuriating for me i mean i it just did something to my spirit you you just and these are majority minority communities too on top of that let's just absolutely right absolutely and, and, and that's and be, not and be mindful because they wanted gary so bad the president at ball state university was told by the chairman of ways and means that they were going to take the balls uh Ball State was going was going to take over the Muncie schools. They didn't want to. They didn't want the. They didn't want the, the real deal to come out publicly. That they really wanted Gary schools, but they threw Muncie schools in to try to have some cover because they misappropriated a mere ten million dollars. But you got virtual schools that have have, have misappropriated over a hundred million dollars. They didn't take them over. No, no, they're giving them more money. They increased how much they got. Exactly. And that's just, that's just unsettling to me because the bottom line is the people that are suffering the most are the children. And, and no, there are children. There, there are, are children in our communities. And, and our that's future. Why, that's why um, you need to really recognize um, what you have here in terms of uh, Greg Porter who sits on appropriations and me, who is uh, on appropriation, uh, he, he sits on Ways and Means, excuse me. Uh, that's what it's called in the House. And he's the chair of Ways and Means for the Senate and the minority. He's the minority leader on Ways and Means for the House uh, Democrats. And uh, I serve on appropriations as just a mere member. And I am uh, working really, really hard um, every session and, and when w during the summers to try to really understand um, this budgeting process because at the end, somebody has to be able to, to know where those dollars are going to be able to track them and to be able to make sure that they redirect them back to where the priority should be because they just assume that we don't know nothing and they can just run roughshod over us 
and uh, do what they want to do. And then our communities end up paying the price for it. And they know it. And they sit and laugh all the way to the bank. But you got Greg Porter on there who is uh, so knowledgeable. And, and I'm just going to give you my props, my brother, because you are so knowledgeable and you have data that just it just amazes me. The, the numbers that kind of roll off his, his lips. And then you've got me who ain't quite as, as uh, knowledgeable, but who is committed to working uh, yeah. really hard to try to understand it so that I can make sure because we have to know there needs to be people of color who are representing our community. We have to know where those dollars are going, what they're doing, how they're appropriating them so we can make sure we get some dollars for our community. Well, we already know and that. It, Go it, ahead, Bob. And Senator, and Senator Bro, and we're, we're knowledgeable, but you know, we just got to let our people know the facts. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and there's something else, Dana, that, that our listeners need to understand. We got COVID dollars that have come to this you know, state of Indiana, $2.4 billion. Mm. Okay. And those dollars have gone to try to help address the COVID that, that Nancy Pelosi and, 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 Chuck, Chuck. and the people are fighting for right mm -hmm. now. Now, when you talk about that, those dollars, we got till the quote unquote the end of, um, I think it's December 30th to spend those dollars. We've only spent uh, three, uh, 313 million, uh, about, about $313 million that, that have been spent, but we allocated like $1.9 billion. Okay. What's, what you spent or what you appropriated is two different things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we still run about a, almost a little less than a million dollars that has not been spent. And this is the 22nd of October. And we got to the 30th of, of uh, December. I want to see them how they're going to spend all that money. Well, and what they're well gonna you know do. what? I, I understand what they're trying to do is they're hoping that the feds will change the rules on how those dollars can be spent. Oh, yeah. And they want to use it to backfill some of the uh, deficits that they think we have from revenues and uh, revenue shortfalls uh, from sales tax and income tax because of COVID. And so they're trying to hold on to as much of that money as they can so they can put it back into our budget. But, but those are our tax that, that dollars. That was not its intent. That was not how the money is intended. No. And there are people who are losing their homes, yes. who don't have food. We have been bitching about this as a Senate Democrat caucus. Um, uh, we have been really bitching about it because, um, you know, the intent of that money is to get out into the communities that need it. And uh, just to give you an example of how they pick, pick and choose, um, some uh, a representative from the meat packers came to talk to me about um, a need. they needed some of these CARES dollars because, you know, they're on the front lines. Uh, the demand for um, their, their product is, is rising and they don't have um, enough uh, workers. They don't have enough PPE and they don't have enough capacity to meet the demand. And they need some of those CARES dollars to expand. So um, I, I met with the Lieutenant Governor who oversees that as well. And uh, she was very supportive, but she said, you know, I, we've got to get the money from the governor. So she and I both signed a, sent a letter on behalf of these meat packers, and lo and behold, the governor released four million dollars into a um, grant fund that would allow for the expansion of the meat packers industry. I said, now the only reason why I was a party to that is because the lieutenant governor wanted it, and uh, and, and so that's the only reason why uh, that money was released. And the lieutenant governor asked me, she said, "How did you get involved with this?" I don't know. Somebody came to me and I help whoever comes to me. But the bottom line, it showed me that they got money and they pick and choose who and to whom they release it. Now, here's the, thing that so gets, here's the thing that gets me. Now, aren't these the same Republicans that run around and say, you know, we want to give your tax dollars back to you because we feel like you know what to do with your money better than the government does. So why are they, why are they hold on to it like that? Well, we just talked about it, but I mean the hypocrisy, like it's not, it's not big and flashy, like, you know, Rudy Giuliani doing crazy stuff in a hotel room, but, but, but this is, this is the kind of stuff where they want to tell you every 15 minutes, like they did in that, in that gubernatorial debate, we want the tax dollars to be in the people's hands so they can make decisions. But when the money come back, they hold on to it. Like, nah. We ain't finna get it. And, and they know nine times yeah. out well, no, nine times out of ten, their people don't know what the hell's going on. They always underestimate our people, but you see, our people are in the lines standing three and four hours trying to vote. Our people, we know what the deal is. They always try to underestimate us 
that we don't know, but it's their people that have given them the choice. They, they don't spend their money right. They don't know what the hell they're doing. They, they need government. Their people need government. They're the very ones that say they don't want it, but they need it. They're the very ones who need it. We need it too, but we know it. Representative Porter? Well, yeah, and uh, I wish Gene wouldn't be so animated. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but seriously, you know, and, and you know, we're, we're going to talk about the numbers. And you're right. When, when, when Frank O'Bannon was governor, they kept saying, give the money back. We didn't need to hoard, hoard that much money. They like taking pictures of their bank account. They want to talk about how, how they have a triple A bond rating. That's what they keep talking about, what they want to see. But we got a, we, we got two point, we had $2.4 billion surplus out of 30, 30, $34 billion budget over, over, over a two year period. We only needed 9 to 10% of that. We, and, but, but they wanted more than that. You only need nine, uh, nine to 11% of, of, of that money. So you have about $800 million you could turn back to the people. Well, and, you know and what? feed their families. $800 million you can, could gain back, can gain back to the people. Now, as Senator Bro did it hit a little bit, we are above forecast right now. We're $700 million above forecast. Okay, uh, on our budget so we, or you know, surplus? We, uh, yes, we are. So, but but we got an economic forecast coming in December, and that's how we're going to build the budget for the next two years. But as Senator Bro said, they want to keep that money so they can backfill the budget for 23 24. That's the goal because, like I said, they only they've only expended 330 313 million dollars out of the two point uh, uh, 2.4 billion dollars. And they and they still have over two point one billion dollars that they have to spend by by the thirtieth of December. Mm, mm. Well, you know what kills me is that while we tout these AAA ratings and while we go around with our chest puffed out saying how how financially stable and we've got a balanced budget and how great Indiana is in that regard, we got the lowest rankings of people on uh who who's from a salary perspective you know that their, their per capita income doesn't really compare and it doesn't allow them to really um uh you know have a really fine quality of life we've got numbers in obesity and, and and smoking and infant mortality i mean we got a lot of things we got a lot of problems we got issues in indiana yeah and some of that money would be helpful for with some of these issues so rather than touting that we've got this triple a rating which is important you know you need to have a strong credit rating i, I get that but um, you need to also balance that with the needs of, of your constituencies. Because it's and, our money. This, this administration <laughs> this administration has neglected and continued to neglect the human infrastructure of the state of Indiana. That's right. When we, when we only give $300,000, Dana, to the food banks <sighs> out of a $34 billion budget, we only given three hundred million dollars per year. That's a travesty. Mm. Ohio gives twenty million dollars a year for their food bank to take care of the people that are in need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you heard Senator Bro talk about it, people that are losing their homes and evictions. You know, now I think they did open up, looked at another thirty or forty million dollars to try to try to address that. But he only does what he has to do when when it's politically. Expedient. Expedient bring up in his administration. And remember, he had that subcommittee with Luke Kinley and other individuals out there, uh, Schellinger, that was trying to say, this is what you can do with your money. That committee of seven people who was no was, was not accountable to anybody, no minutes to meetings, no nothing, but were his, uh, no, no minutes. his subcommittee on expenditures. Wait, wait, wait. Government officials are having... Back. Look, the CARES you... Act. These folks oversaw how those CARES Act dollars were. It was them that must have decided to release that four million for the um, food packers grant program. So his, there, there are these seven people. I didn't know they didn't have minutes and all of that, but uh, they, no, they have they one pack on there. It's John Thompson, and I think that was an afterthought. That only happened after somebody. I think Senator Taylor brought it to their attention that hey, there ain't no blacks on here, so they found John Thompson real quick. That, you know, that's what I think. I, I don't know. Don't don't quote me on that. Who's John but, Thompson? No, 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 that, no, you're right. He was an afterthought because we as a black caucus and Greg said it, where are, where's the African-American? And, and then they went and got John. 
Okay? And they did do that. It wasn't another act But, but see, why do we and have to keep telling them that? They know what out, we... 75 days out, he creates this other position on diversity and inclusion. Yeah. yeah. After being there for three and a half years. Yeah. 75 days out from the election. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, we need somebody. Come on, man. That's because you got and a black doctor. Dr. Myers said, Dr. Myers said he wouldn't have to have no diversity or inclusion office. His entire administration would make sure that there was inclusion. <laughs> exactly. I mean, how do you see that's that's one of the biggest problems is like people get in their little bubble and they and they don't even recognize uh, when I t when I interviewed Representative Carson, Congressman Carson last week, he asked me about white supremacy and what I thought about that. And I said, white supremacy prevents white folk from seeing white supremacy. They don't even realize when they in the room and it's just them and we ain't there. Same thing with the Latino community. How the hell do you keep on having having all these conversations you look around the room and ain't nobody with melanin in the room i just don't understand well, how you can that that's what happened we got this committee at the state house called the continuity committee uh and it's supposed to be looking at how we uh establish ourselves during this covid period you know we'll, we'll, how do we do social distancing at the state house and what are the protocols and the rules and blah 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 well somebody brought it to my attention because i didn't even think to ask um that there is no one of color on this continuity committee figuring out how uh, all of this stuff should handle. And black folks are at some of the highest risk. And, and you know, you got uh, Indiana Black Legislative Conference, you got a few black folks in the state house. And um, so, you know, there should, we need, somebody should have been at that table. And I, I, I didn't, unfortunately, I didn't catch it. But uh, somebody should have been at that table to represent, to make sure that, that our interests were being represented, to so make sure that they knew that, hey, you know, you got to make sure that people wear masks and that there's some kind of, of um, a hold accountable for folks who don't wear masks because we, we're, we're the ones who are most at risk of getting sick. So we have talked about some really critical things that are happening in that state house. And I love the fact that you both have been in there and you have been in the trenches and you see the inner workings. And and I, I hear a lot of times, you know, and it and it, it kind of ticks me off at times when I hear people say that our Democratic Party doesn't look out for black folk when most of the black folk that are elected to office are Democrats. And <clears throat> so it, help us and motivate people to understand that the only way that we are going to be counted is if we decide to show up in the room, whether they want us there or not. Cause when I ran for office, wasn't nobody looking for the, the cross-dressing African-American lesbian to be running against the speaker of the house. But the bottom line was that I felt like my community needed to be represented. You guys have been doing this for a long time, multi-generational in multiple areas, but talk about the importance of us taking it upon ourselves, not looking for people to say, come on in, come have a seat. Cause they're not going to do it. Talk about the importance of us kicking doors in. Well, you know, I, I heard something recently where uh, some black women were being interviewed and they were saying that they still were not uh, sure who, how they were going to vote this election. They didn't think they were going to vote for Trump, but, they weren't sure they were going to vote for Biden because they, they felt as though the, the black party, the uh, Democratic Party has taken the black vote and the black female vote for granted. And you got cities all around this country that don't have, you know, that have black representation and they're still struggling and they still look poor and they're still poverty. Well, um, unfortunately, again, as I said, you know, sometimes we need to recognize that in order for us to be successful, we have to really support us. And, um, and, we, we may be in there, but unless we have numbers in there to help us, then uh, our voices are really muffled. And so people have to really come out and vote to show that, hey, if you don't take our issues seriously, we will vote you out, period. And we have the power and we have the capacity and we are able to go to the polls. I mean, Trump is getting ready, I believe, find this out for himself right now. We will, we, uh, I don't know why sometimes we, what, what, what it takes to keep, keep us motivated, but um, you know, th that's why I would really like to show eyes on the prize um, every election cycle so that people can see the history yes. and understand what, it, what was involved with us being able to uh, get to the polls and how it's not something that should be taken lightly. And just like democracy, what we're finding with democracy, it's, 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 it's an experiment that uh, it's not guaranteed. I mean, we've got to fight for it every, all the time to keep it alive and to keep it in existence. And it's the same thing with us. We have to fight for um, our voices to always be heard and we can't ever sit it out. We can't ever uh, complain and we can't
can't never say, well, you know, I'm not interested because you are the very people who need us to be effective and we can't be effective without you. So, you know, it's a really very symbiotic relationship that we have and, and it doesn't work if only one half is in the equation. This is, this is also what we have to do. We have to galvanize and, and just target an individual or a situation like Black Lives Matter movement and move it to voting movement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Our vote matters, your vote matters. Together we can make some changes. And we gotta do it just like the, the deaf community did with Cindy knowing. Uh, the deaf community got together, galvanized a, a, a Republican district and put a Democrat in there. And sh you know, even though this is Indiana, they did a thing like Missouri, they would like to show me state, they showed her the door. And that's what we had to do. Now, if there are people out there of color who say we don't know what we want to do, why don't they go and just think about what this president, the CEO, has done or not done for African Americans? You've heard of commercials. Well, I've talked about it before. Almost 200 people in, in, in the courts all white, okay. The, that the, right the, there. The young men that that he went and, and uh, that he wrote that the one that the, the give him the death penalty for allegedly raping this woman in you know in the park. They all were, were you know free from that. He never apologized, but that's just the little power that they're on. We have and we got to do it quietly sometimes. But yet, be forceful. Mm -hmm. You don't tell it. Still, waters one deep. You know, we 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 got to drown some people so they can understand how 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 great a rapids we have underneath. Because we can tow them under. Period. I love it. Yeah, well, you know that. That's why I miss Miss Carson because she had organized the the. Uh, uh, this community, and, and we really need to be organized to really leverage our strength. We have a lot of strength, and if we can marshal it and get it organized, we can uh, elect people who will be representative of us, and we can make them have the power that they will need to go in there and say, hey, listen, we want this, and if you don't get it, this, then we're going to have our people vote you out. But they put us in the districts where they don't really have the ability to vote anybody in or out because they only have you know, the, 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 you know, the districts are so heavily, heavily Jerry gerrymandered. Yeah. I can understand those black women. I can't understand them thinking about Trump, but I don't think they were thinking about Trump. I would, but I think, you know, the Democratic Party does, you know, you know, I'm still um, kind of reeling from the fact that we, we didn't support um, Dee Thornton, who, who had greased that uh, race um, two years earlier. And so uh, we had an opportunity to, to support her and we didn't. And I th think that was a misstep by our party. I think the, the Democratic Party does have some uh, coming to Jesus to do, um, but um, but you can't get there by people not participating in the process. And that's what I'm saying. I, and I agree with you 100%. Like when I ran, I saw that there were things, I'm like, dang, there were things that the party could have done to legitimize my race, right? And I understood like, you know, some people didn't want to piss off Brian Bosma by supporting me and blah, blah, blah. And I heard all of that. Right. But I saw that there were things that we could have done differently as a party to support that candidacy. But instead of me getting mad and moaning and groaning and airing all of that out, I just said, you know what, John Zodi, I want to help. I believe yeah. I can bring something to the party. I believe that I can help. And one of the things that I wanted to do to was to change that. I hate that narrative that we as Democrats only show up when we want, we want votes or we want money. And so that's why we've had our power of the black vote events. We've been, you know, before COVID, we was traveling around hosting events all over the, the state because it was important that we show up in communities that they didn't expect us to show up in, even in our rural communities where there are no black people. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to show that and talk about what our policies are. See, people get all excited about a, a, a candidate because he got great personality or I'm not excited about this candidate because they kind of drive when they talk. But look, look at the policies that, and the platforms that they stand for. And to me, that should tell you everything. Line yourself up with the people that speak closest to your values. I'm sorry, I'm not going to find a candidate that's 100% with me. 
right? But mm -hmm. I know that if I get someone who's on the same plane, same philosophy, same platform that people over profits, I'm going to be, I'm going to come out ahead and my community is going to come out ahead. And I think sometimes we think that politics is this other man's game. No, they take yeah, your tax right, dollars. Right. It's that's your, right. it's your game. That's the only reason why, Dana, that's the only reason why we've survived it. As I said, my grandmother understood that. Yeah. She understood that way back then. I mean, this is our game. This is, you know, I, I know they want you to believe that only rich, wealthy, white males can, can be in politics. But the bottom line is, is that it's about who gets the most votes. And if you figure out a way, like when I ran, I didn't raise a lot of money, but I was I, I understood four years ago how to use social media. I did, I understood how to, to, to run a, a run my campaign on a shoestring. And I don't and I say it once, I say it again. You do not need permission to serve your community. Amen. You don't Amen. need it. Amen. Uh, on that, on uh, that Dana Reed, Dana, I think I'm getting ready to call you Dana Reed from uh <laughs> Um, not Joy Reed. Joy, Joy Reed, because you remind me of her, girl. You got it. You got it going on. This is a great program, man. I uh, love this. How do I tune into this program if I want to watch you doing the uh, Facebook you Live like every Thursday night? Yep, from six to seven p.m. Facebook Live, and then I have a YouTube page, and I'll make sure I share the link because I record this. Okay, yeah, share the link. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like yeah. to watch you. But okay, so now before we end the show, uh, you guys are going to win re-election, and you're going to be back in the General Assembly in January. Talk about a couple of the policies that you guys are, are wanting to, to move forward because we got to move forward. So talk about what you guys are going to be working on. Well, I will be doing um, health disparities um, as the ranking minority member on health and um, trying to, um, um, you know, uh, get pregnant women the assistance that they need with the doula program and, and that sort of thing. Okay. Representative Porter? Um, there, there's, there's several things I'm going to work on. Our, our goal is to continue to be on ways and means. I also serve on public health and insurance also. So which are in the healthcare area. We'll try to work with uh, Senator Bro to make sure that the doula program is, is funded. To make sure that programs are, 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 are for African Americans and people of color are, are funded adequately and equitably in, in the next two year budget. Amen. I will continue to work on education initiatives. Um, one, one is uh, making sure that we really have become more transparent about how much money we're spending on education, um, virtual schools, charter schools, vouchers, et cetera, which we didn't really you know, get into that tonight uh, you know, in, in detail. Uh, but, but just have the budget be more transparent. I, I'm looking at, uh, I have a piece of legislation dealing with juvenile justice. And, and, and our whole Black Caucus initiative are dealing with justice uh, in, in, in regards to the Indiana General Assembly. We have, a, all of us have one or two bills that we're going to file and going to push this, this upcoming year. Well, we don't have any elections next year, but that doesn't mean it's an off year. So maybe I can get you guys to come back during the general session and explain uh, the, some of the progress that you guys are making. If you got, because I, I don't mind asking, because people want to know. <laughs> and we don't mind telling. <laughs> I don't mind answering. You're, 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 you've got you, you, your questions are, are thoughtful, and uh, you've done your research and your little rant that you do at the beginning of your program. So I don't mind answering. You just give me a call. I'll try to be on time next time. That's all right. That's all right. In my head, I had it in my head. It started at seven. Dana, Shut up. Dana uh -huh. I don't. Dana, I don't. I don't. I don't call your 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 uh, pre log <laughs> a, a a rant. I call it prime the pump. Okay, prime the pump. <laughs> so you prime, prime the pump, the pump, like prime a, the pump. for progress. Absolutely. Prime the pump for progress. I love it. Prime Absolutely. the pump for progress. You ought to coin that one, Dana. I, I think I am. I think I am. Y'all, thank y'all so much for joining me. Um, first, uh, Representative Porter, tell the people where they can find you um, if they want to donate to your campaign. I know I put your link out there, but do you have a website, something like that? Social media. Uh, we have a Democrat website. Uh, I will give you my my cell phone number. I know people go like what? Erico three one seven. Three one seven. Two one three. Two one three. Five eight zero nine. Three one seven. Two one three. Fifty eight zero nine. I love it. I love it. So that he's giving you his phone number, so you can give him a call. Representative uh, Senator Gene uh, Bro, tell the people where they can find you. 
Well, I have a uh, Facebook, uh, bro for Indiana, um, dot com. Um, I've got a Twitter account. I've, I'm on Instagram. Um, you can find me on all of those places. Uh, but I too will give my my uh, personal cell number since Greg the the prime that pump. Um, my 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 cell is three one seven four nine zero. <laughs> four nine zero 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 one seven. Now, Greg, how can I not give my number? Hey, <laughs> I love it. Indiana Zone, Dana Black, turn left. You see, y'all keep asking me when I'm going to run again. I don't need to run. I am well represented. <laughs> I, you only run yeah, when you... We can know, Dana. We can know. No, 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 well, you, come holler at me when you're ready to step down. That's different. That's different. But listen, it's, you know... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, holler me when you're ready. Okay. So the, the beautiful part is, is that we can take this opportunity to learn from our, our mentors and our leaders. These are leaders. You know, I, y'all hear me complain all the time about we have a bunch of elected officials, but we don't have any elected leaders. Here are two elected leaders because they are going to battle every session for us, an uphill battle. They're pushing this boulder uphill to make sure that your life is significant and has value in the state of Indiana. When other people smiling in your face, talking about they triple A rating, you know, that rainy day fun. But what good is all that money? Like you just bought a, you got a, a beautiful home. You got all this money, but you got a hole in the roof. And we have a okay. hole in the roof in the state of Indiana. Our schools are, are underfunded. Our teachers are underfunded. We, we Our wages are still stagnant. They're busting up unions to prevent that. Our environment is a disaster. Forget about yeah. what Governor Holcomb told you the other night. Our environment is a disaster. Forget about what Rainwater's talking about. He would just, he would rather just shut the whole damn government down and say, all men for themselves. I don't like that idea because I'm going to need somebody to come shovel the driveway for me. That's all I'm saying. Somebody got to shovel the snow. Somebody got to shovel the snow. Somebody got to pick up the trash. Somebody got to pick up the trash. So I don't know what he talking about. You know what I'm saying? But this is what it looks like. They're in there fighting. So y'all support Senator Gene Bro. Representative Greg Porter, they represent me. I am excited about it. I can't wait to see and hear from them uh, in the wintertime when they talk about what they've been working on on these committees and trying to get these bills passed. I am really curious to hear how many Democrat bills uh, get called to, to committee this year because I understand in the Senate, I think y'all got like 12. <laughs> it was like um, some stupid number. We used to be, during a long session, we used to be unlimited, but the only thing this this continuity committee has come up with, as far as I can tell, is to determine that we should be limited to between 10 and 15 bills. And my, and my comment to that was, you mean this is what they consider the most important consideration during this COVID is how many bills we need to run? I mean, they haven't talked about PPE. They haven't talked about contact tracing. They haven't talked well, they about don't care. They haven't talked about mask wear. They haven't, they haven't talked about none of we that. But they but they've decided to limit us to ten to fifteen bills. I said, well, y'all don't hear our bills anyway. What difference does it make? Exactly. They're they're not frontline workers. They're not out there in the streets. They're not the ones having to, to risk their life and limb to make sure they can get their Amazon delivered. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Indiana right. Zone, Dana Black, turn well. left. <laughs> okay, Greg, Representative Greg Porter, Senior, Senator Jean Bro, man, this I was excited about this show. I set it up like this on purpose because it is so important that we know who our representatives are. These two, I actually can call them, but y'all, they didn't gave you the number. I don't feel so special no more. They shared the number, <laughs> so you can call them too. Next week, <laughs> next week, the final Thursday show before election night, we will have. Our Democratic candidate for Lieutenant Governor, uh, Linda Lawson, on for the entire hour. Because you know what? She, wow. She's got to have that stage. Y'all got to hear that story. That's going to be a good show. Oh, my God. She's been on before. Now it's like, you know, she's digging in. I love that she stepped up. She came out of retirement. Uh, I, uh, I think Dr. Woody Myers' campaign took a boost when she came on because she is, she's she's yeah. been in, the, in our state and worked in our state house, and she's got the chops. And, she you know, I'm going to try to keep her from – being too real, cause she can get real too. So we gonna we gonna keep her. She's she's a B A W man. She real, but she is my girl. Um, she's one of those strong women. So make sure you tune in next week, and then uh, election night, election night. 
I'm going to be hanging out with Chairman Zodi, and we're going to be interviewing people who win their elections, and we're going to be having panel discussions. We're getting it all together. I was kind of going to do something on my own, but let's work with the party. Let's do something fantastic, and we can, and you know, one of the cool things is, is, is as results come in, if we get any results, we can talk to our winners and get their uh, interviews and talk about what they're planning on doing. So election night, I know it's going to be between like 7 and 10.30, 7 and 11 myself chairman zodi and we're putting some panels together that will be a fun night me and wow. the, me and the chairman get along great you know we have different personalities i always get his gold if i talk about uh early childhood education and and voting rights he it gets him teed off and he gets going so make sure y'all stay tuned this is what we're doing we're bringing you the information that you need don't forget to, to send me the link to your show dana absolutely i'm gonna send you the youtube okay. link after i get it all done y'all okay. and if you like what we're doing if you like what turn left is about and you like the information Click on my donate link. Yes, yes, yes. I have one too. Click on okay. my donate link. Um, and, and whatever you have, donate to the candidates first. And then if you have anything left over, consider donating to Turn Left so that we can continue to bring this platform to you. Y'all, this was a, a thrill of a lifetime. Representative Porter, thank you so much for coming on for the first time. I really do appreciate it. Senator Bro, second time's a charm. We're going to do it again. Y'all, Indiana's on. Dana Black, Turn Left, every Thursdays. This is what we do, y'all. Hey.